This is Module 6 of Mar Yeshua, the Unknown Jesus. Here we're going to consider the spirituality and religious practices of Mar Yeshua and his disciples. Perhaps the first kind of institution or practice we should study when we look at the spiritual practices of Mar Yeshua is the Havura. This is the messianic fellowship that he experienced with his apostles, with his disciples, and with those who followed him. The Havura is, uh, is a word that can refer to a guild or an organization, can be a trade guild, but it's a religious group, a group uh, of people who come together for spiritual purposes to celebrate a, a Shabbat Seder or some other kind of uh, religious gathering that people come together for. And it has a very old and venerable history in uh, Israel. If we look at the origin of the Havura or the Guild, we go back to the prophets. The earliest prophets uh, succeeding the time of Moses uh, lived outside of the cities and were not part of the monarchical or temple establishment. If we remember the stories of David, King David, uh, and Solomon and so on. Uh, prophets like Nathan came into the royal city from outside, from the desert. We don't know exactly where, perhaps in communities that lived in the desert, but they did live in communities. They were prophetic guilds, prophetic communities. And they were living in a situation, uh, in a much simpler version than what we find later in at Qumran and places like this. So there were the prophetic guilds, the guilds of the prophets. Elijah uh, lived with other people who uh, who was going to succeed him was an issue and uh, the issue was decided by his mantle which he passed on to Elisha. So the earliest of the gatherings, the religious gatherings of the Havurot were those of the prophets. Now the Babylonian captivity uh, was uh, a real watershed in the history for uh, for the religion of Israel because the northern kingdom of Israel had been decimated by the Assyrians, and now, a hundred years later, the, the remaining kingdom of Judah, in spite of the fact that it has become very religious and it has united the concerns of the prophetic guilds and the priesthood and uh, brought them all together in a kind of spirituality that is involved in temple worship, uh, Judah is also taken captivity, and all the educated people, the people who can read and write, and who are the scribes, and who are the priests, and the royal family, and the princes, and so on, are all forced to uh, be taken cap in captivity to Babylon, where they are treated generally rather well. In fact, there is kind of a mutual admiration between the uh, Jewish priesthood and the uh, uh, priesthood of the uh, of the priests of uh, the Persian king uh, Zarathustra Zoroaster the Magi and so on and at this time and at this place there was a great deal of enrichment of uh, Jewish philosophy and Jewish ideas uh, the, the, the bringing together of the Jewish creation story and uh, many other things because of that very fruitful um, kind of uh, bringing together of these two Middle Eastern religions and in the captivity Jews became a people of what would eventually become a people of a book of the book because their scribes and their priests brought together and wove together their writings, their sacred writings, both from the northern kingdom and from the southern kingdom. The teachings of the prophets that had been kept or write and written down or memorialized, they brought together the court chronicles and other things. And uh, uh, we know somewhat about how this was put together because we, can't, we find the, the threads or strands of the different sources. J, the Yahwist, E, the Eloist, D, the Deuteronomist, and so on. In the materials that we now call the Old Testament, we can see that things like the story of uh, Noah contains two stories, one in which 
the animals are taken under the arc two by two, and another in which they're taken on seven by seven, but they're all just woven together because everything is sacred, and so the stories are just uh, conflated together, and we find this uh, in lots of places, and scholars have spent a lot of time unraveling this. And this is where this weaving together of all this happened, and, and at this time there was no, no more a temple, no more a place for animal sacrifice. And therefore the place where spirituality and religion was discussed and the scriptures were read and discussed was over the meal. And it was at this time that the Sabbath, Shabbat, seems to have started to be celebrated. Before this time in history, all we could find uh, uh, any evidence of a, of a Sabbath kind of celebration or Shabbat celebration is seems to be sort of a festival or a limping festival, as uh, they called it. Um, uh, different kinds of uh, evidences for s for uh, ritual that existed previous to the time of the captivity are mostly just what existed in the temple, not what existed in people's homes. Now people celebrate their religion in their home. E the father uh, and mother of each uh, family become the, the priestesses and the priest and the priestess of this religion of Judaism. And here is where the stories are told. And here is where the story of the Passover becomes terribly important. Passover was really not something that we find celebrated before this time. It uh, was kind of put together as a celebration of liberation from captivity, the story being told of the liberation from Egyptian captivity, but by implication, liberation from Babylonian captivity. And uh, so at this time, we begin to develop the, the religion we think of as... Uh, as Judaism as opposed to ancient Hebrew religion. <coughs> now at this point of time Ezra and Nehemiah and other people get permission to go and rebuild the temple but not to rebuild the, wills or the walls around it, not to defend it, not to make it into a political entity but there is so much, much respect for the Jewish religion among the uh, Babylonians that, and the Babylonian uh, royalty that they allow them to go and rebuild the temple because that is the center and heart of uh, their religion as they understood at that time. So Ezra and Nehemiah went out and Zerubbabel and established for the first time a Jewish tradition of Freemasonry or Masonry. And the temple was built. We call it the second temple <coughs> of Ezra and Nehemiah. And people were allowed to go back and re-inhabit the land. And it's there and then that... Um, the Sumerians who were living on the land, most of whom were quite uh, illiterate and ignorant and not royal in their lineage, had intermarried with an awful lot of non-Jewish people, were required by the Jewish settlers to either divorce their wives or get out. And uh, it was pretty, pretty nasty stuff. And uh, this was done, and this was the beginning of a tight religious orientation to uh, the city of Jerusalem and to the second temple of Solomon. Now, at this time, people moved out onto the land and to different places, and Jews were no longer in just one place. They were not just in Israel. They were in Babylon. Many of them stayed in Babylon and many other cities. They were traders. Uh, they lived in other cities. They spoke other languages, and the Jewish diaspora was spreading out all over. And so many of these people then would eventually make a pilgrimage to the temple, maybe once in their lives, once in their lifetimes, or once in their uh, uh, for for something like uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a young boy's uh, in introduction into manhood, uh, his bar mitzvah, uh, perhaps would be a cause or in order to uh, seek special kinds of prayers for certain kinds of things, there would be perhaps pilgrimage made. But the main religion was then carried out in another kind of place that was invented at this time called a synagogue. And a synagogue means a place where people gather together. It really is just a, a could well as well be called a church. And so in every Jewish village there was a synagogue. And it was there at the synagogue that uh, there were educated people who read the scriptures, where people studied Torah, and uh, 
and then also at home they carried on the Shabbat and uh, other traditions and there got to be really two kinds of religion in Israel the synagogue form of religion around which Phariseeism and the Hasidic forms or the um, the the non-temple forms of Judaism began to emerge and that which was actually practiced at the temple uh, by fiat of what whoever was ruling the political area of Jerusalem at that time and there were many changes there and uh, as a result of that um, probably the most Im single important religious gathering that was developed was the Shabbat Seder the celebration of a meal that people would come to at sundown on on Friday evening the end of the week and uh, they would eat together they would read scripture they would sing songs and psalms and then there would be no work done at all for the whole next day until the sun went down on Saturday and that was the keeping of the Sabbath or Shabbat later on the Christians would uh, interpret all this in a in in such a way as to make Sunday the the Sabbath but it's actually Saturday of course and the Shabbat Seder which became very central to family uh, celebrations and family religion became also central to the Havura to the groups of people that not only gathered as a community in the synagogue or at home with their families but gathered with a small group of religious compatriots The prophets had uh, not been supporters of the temple. They had been, in fact, enemies of the temple and the monarchy for quite some time and had considered to be evil and against God's will to census and number the people and that the worship in the synagogue, which very, I mean, in the temple, which very much imitated all other kinds of Near Eastern animal sacrifice type worship, was not essential religion. Basically, if you read Amos or any of the other prophets, they consider that the sacrifice of animals, uh, which is kind of a bribery of God and the use of priesthood and trying to flatter God and all that sort of thing, did not constitute essential righteousness. And that attitude became, became much more popular m among people who were not regularly attached to and working with the temple. And so that, an that, that attitude became the, the, the attitude that was uh, uh, in many ways uh, part of uh, the Hasidic and Pharise Pharisaic movements. Not that the temple was not respected, it was highly respected and considered to be the center of things, but it was also considered to be a place that could be perverted or that could be uh, used for purposes that were pr purely political and not uh, according to God's righteousness. And eventually there got to be strong sectarian opposition to the temple establishment in Jerusalem. And that's what happened when we had all these communities, the Zadokite communities and so on, and divisions over who was who was holding the proper priesthood and, and all this sort of thing. Uh, that is what was going on at the time of Yeshua and after his resurrection when his brother James was, uh, was uh, asked to do the work of the high priest of the temple on the um, Day of Atonement. We're told by many historical documents that he actually did this even though he was not part of the temple establishment uh, because the high priest was simply a politically appointed wealthy person that was hated by the common people and, and they didn't trust him to do the work properly. So it was very important. The temple work was very important. Of course, James was murdered by the temple establishment. <coughs> so a religious guild or religious order was the Havura that we would come together with uh, and around the Master Jesus that his disciples came together with and at, at that meal which was done in a kind of a ritualistic way teachings were given and received readings and scripture were given uh, Psalms were sung, and uh, it was a place of of uh, learning at the table. And it's very interesting that one can find uh, that uh, the process of eating and chewing food uh, 
is something that really opens you up to receiving uh, instruction. It's a very good place for teaching children, and it's a good place for adults to learn things. Um, and, it, of course, the worst possible thing you can do is uh, eat a meal when you are angry or upset because f somehow you, you eat and drink damnation unto yourself, so to speak, to paraphrase Paul. Uh, there, uh, when you are eating, your body is open and relaxed and your mind is open and relaxed and your soul is open and relaxed. And that is where teaching takes place. Now, there were many gills and many kinds of havurot. Hav havurot. Um, there were the craft gills, and we know within Judaism, after the time of Zerubbabel, there was a tradition of stonemasonry and carpentry, and that was the kind of family that Yeshua was born into. Uh, and he, as the oldest son, undoubtedly was trained in, uh, in, in the craft guild, the guild of the masons that his father uh, was uh, part of. The Essenes, uh, the people of Qumran, also later on the Therapeutae and many of the other uh, groups that were associated with uh, the spiritual aspects of Judaism uh, were gathered together in these kinds of religious orders, the Havura. Now Jesus, who was a Rav, who means a great one, and uh, it's a, a Rav or a Rab, Rabbi means Rabbi, means my great one, Jesus uh, was a Rav with disciples. And they not only gathered for a Havura, for teaching and instruction, but for a Messianic Havura, a Messianic fellowship. And so their Havura of eating and drinking together was an enactment of the Messianic marriage banquet, which we have much more to learn about as we understand the institution of Jewish uh, marriage and weddings and how that worked into the mysticism of the Messiah. And what Yeshua did that no one else did is he took women disciples, not just men, but women as well. And uh, that is uh, where they met with him in that context. They often provided meals for him, and then they sat at his feet while he taught. And many of them become very uh, powerful and trusted disciples. So the Hevura, the Messianic Fellowship, is an important kind of understanding. It's out of that that eventually the idea of the Eucharist or the communion service develops in Christianity. <coughs> 
Now we're going to look at the Hevura as it was used uh, as a Hevura meal, was used as a messianic or marriage marriage banquet. If we read the Song of Songs, which was used and read and uh, sung and, at, at Jewish wedding rituals, uh, that was understood not just as body songs for a wedding ritual, but it was actually the highest form of mysticism. In fact, it was forbidden for rabbis to even study the Song of Songs before the age of 50 because it was such high mysticism that people could get inflated and carried off in the wrong directions with it. The Song of Songs is a mystic relationship between the worshiper and the deity. And the relationship is one of a bride and a groom. And the worshiper is female to the deity as a male. Just as Paul says that uh, Christ and the church are related in this way. The church is the bride of Christ. And uh, in the same way, mankind, humanity, would be wedded to God through the Holy Spirit through the Ruach HaKadosh. And there was a, a, great, uh, a great spiritual teaching about the time of this uh, marriage when God would dwell with man and when man and God, the unity of man and God would again be established in joy and harmony. So it became uh, kind of a way of understanding the deepest form of Kabbalistic mysticism about the union of God and man. Because man was not created by God as a potter creates a pot, as, for example, St. Paul uh, has said in some of his epistles. But mankind was emanated from God. Mankind was uh, generated in the image of God, and the image and likeness of God. And uh, in spite of that, there are far more complications to the story of the beginnings of man and the fall of man and so on. But the real story is the, the reintegration of man and God, the tikkun, the time when uh, God and man are united again and become one. And the allegory that's used is that of human and divine love and human and divine marriage because marriage is a covenant and the covenant of Israel between his people between the people of God and God is like the covenant between a bride and a groom and it's a covenant of love and it's expressed in love and it involves uh, responsibilities that must be carried out both ways in a two-way kind of system so the disciple, as I say, is feminine with respect to the divine. And if we look at the Kabbalistic ramifications, the Jewish mystic, the Messianic banquet is a wedding banquet. The Messianic banquet that we talk about and that Yeshua talks about and that he speaks about in many of his parables, the wedding uh, parables and so on, they are understood and symbolized <coughs> as a wedding banquet. And this is what the, the banquet of uh, the Messiah is. It is the uh, celebration of the reunion of God and man. The Havura meal is a mystic foretaste, one might say, of that union, uh, of, or rather of the celebration of that union. And it becomes what we call a divine communion. Uh, it's a forum for the Master's teaching to the closest disciples. Uh, for example, or later in John's Gospel, we hear about the Word of God is the bread of life and so on. And these uh, kinds of allegories of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the Christ and so on are developed from this concept of divine communion in a sacred wedding meal. <coughs> and Yeshua's Havura meal was uh, based on all these things. It was really an initiatic forum for the inner circle disciples. It wasn't 
uh, he didn't give teachings there that he taught out in the mountains and the hills and standing from a boat in the Sea of Galilee to people gathered on the side or anywhere else. Here in the meal, in this communion, in this mystic communion with his closest disciples who were the ones that were truly committed to the, uh, to the kingdom of God, there he spoke and taught them plainly not uh, just in allegories and parables. Now let's look at the Jewish wedding tradition. It will help us to understand some of the parables that Jesus speaks about weddings. The, the order of events in Jewish betrothal and wedding is first the selection of a bride and then the the price that's paid for the bride is given to the father and uh, then a betrothal is announced and a ketuba is written which is a covenant or relationship between the two it is uh, very very similar to uh, the understanding of the covenant between the people of God and God you are a chosen people. You are, and you are the elect. The elect are those who both have been elected and who choose to be elected. And it's a renewing of the covenant. Is this concept of uh, in the in the Jewish wedding in the Messianic banquet and so on, is that the disciple has been chosen, and the covenant is being renewed. Now the bride consents and accepts the gifts in the real wedding ceremony and uh, this is uh, kind of in reference to the idea that the disciple must uh, must accept the divine gifts and that is uh, called submission of the lower to the higher it's the posture or the concept of naham this, uh, this word in Islam is translated Islam it means submission to God and Naham, uh, which is very badly translated in the Greek New Testament as metanoia, which then comes out in English as repentance and so on. But basically, Naham is the accepting of the divine will and way and submission to that. And then the gifts that are brought forth as a result of that are the gifts of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, miracles and other things that come along in the Messianic Age. <coughs> Now, the bride uh, uh, then um, institutes a mikvah, a cleansing or a washing, and um, the groom uh, departs, as, as the father does, and prepares a house with a bridal chamber. This is a special place where uh, the two lovers and the two to be married will have uh, the most intimate of relationship. And while the groom is away preparing this bridal chamber, the bride awaits the return of the groom. <coughs> now, this can be compared in the spirituality of the early Christians or the early Messianic Christians to many things. The bridal mikvah is the baptism. And it's the baptism of John because Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples did, we're told. And the, the sayings of Jesus uh, in the, uh, bef uh, that are remembered later in the Gospels, uh, especially in John's Gospel, uh, where he says, I go to prepare a place for you, is very much reminiscent of this idea of the groom, Jesus being the groom, the Christ, going to prepare a place for the bride, the disciple. Now, in Jewish tradition, at midnight, the bridegroom would return and abduct the bride, literally kidnap the bride. Now, we know that in ancient times, pre-civilized times, that, in fact, was the way uh, men got themselves brides as they kidnapped them. Seven brides for seven, bro seven brothers is uh, sort of a modern-day um, parody 
of the rape of the Sabine women. We know that among the ancient Greeks and among many others, this is the way that brides were taken because they could not be taken from your own clan. They had to be taken from another clan or else you would transgress the taboos. It was very bad for people to breed with their people from their own clan. When the bridegroom returned, it, it was a ceremonial event, and of course the bride was going with, with her permission and everything else for him to abduct the bride, and the shofar was sounded. It was a, a ceremonial event. Now, this is uh, emblematic of and allegorical for the returning or the coming of the Messiah, or the Bar Enosh, who comes to uh, wed mankind and bring him into the divine family. Now the wedding is done under a chupa, uh which is a kind of uh, uh, representation of a tent or a tabernacle. Very often it was a very large uh, uh, prayer garment And for seven days, bride and groom were isolated. They were alone in the bridal chamber. And it was a gu guarded by a, quote, friend of the bridegroom, someone he could trust very closely. And when they had had intercourse and the garments, the white garments she wore, were stained with her virgin's blood, then, and this sounds very barbaric, but the uh, the groom would would bring the evidence of her virginity to his friend who would then show, hold it up and show it to everybody so that all witnesses could see that she in fact was a virgin and, uh, and there could be no doubt about uh, the paternity of the children and so on. And this dated back to very ancient uh, patriarchal religion. Now this time of isolation in the bridal chamber, which in modern Jewish weddings is not seven days, uh, but in sometimes it's for a couple of days. But this isolation is comparable to uh, one's realization of mystic communion through the Ruach HaKodesh, through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Because one becomes one with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit dwells in a person, and then one is the bride. One is feminine always with respect to deity. <coughs> now, after one week, a, a seven days, seven days of creation, uh, Shavau, Shavua, that should be, uh, the bride and groom are dressed as a king and queen, and then they preside over what we've been getting to, what we've been talking about, the marriage banquet. The marriage banquet is given for those who are invited friends, like friends of the bridegroom in the Mashal or the parable about the, the brides, uh, about the wedding and so on. And this marriage banquet is that which is participated in uh, mystically, in a mystic communion, in the Havura meal, the messianic meal of Jesus. And you might recall that after the resurrection of Jesus that disciples on, on walking on the road to Emmaus were approached by a stranger they didn't recognize and the stranger started expounding teachings to them and then, then they finally went and they went in for the evening to break bread together and he broke bread and gave it to them and they recognized in the breaking of the bread that they were in the presence of the risen Christ and then he disappeared. That's the way the story is told. And <coughs> that's that's because this meal was the way, uh, the, the, the root way in which Yeshua communicated his deepest teachings about the kingdom to his disciples. So this uh, marriage banquet is the celebration of the completed marriage. The whole marriage is, is done now. It's a done deal, and we're now celebrating that all has gone well. Uh, the bride has accepted the groom. The groom has accepted the bride. The father and the families have accepted it. They have now uh, had the kind of intimacy that will produce children, and they are totally married in every way. <coughs>
and messianic marriage was basically the theme of the earliest Christian mysticism. It was the basis for the understanding of being in the Spirit, being in the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, so many of the early Christians in the first generation were guided by those who were sensitive to and could channel the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And that was all about messianic marriage. The, uh, there's so many of the parables that we find in Mark that come from Peter, that we call them Petrine because they really come from the tradition of Peter. Uh, Paul speaks about the church, the ecclesia, as the bride of Christ. There's so many of the logia or sayings in the Johannine Gospel that are very similar to that. And the whole idea or understanding of the eating of the flesh and blood, the bread is the body and the and the, the wine is the blood of the Christ, is understood in the mystic context of communion, of bride and groom, and that uh, that mystically the um, the union that happens within the soul of each person and happened w through first through Yeshua himself and was mediated to the others that that union is now something that is taken into you as food and drink and in the earliest in the very earliest writings we have about the the communion service the Eucharist and so on uh, within a generation or so of, of the time of the formation of the early churches it is understood totally and mystically as uh, the flesh and blood of the Christ, the flesh and blood of the Messiah, that that is what one is participating in. This is not something that developed later. It was very, very early. You read the the epistles, the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, and and uh, from the very early times, is early, earlier than a lot of the New Testament literature. <coughs> and you'll find this, this theme is there already. It's not something that was introduced uh, by way just of sort of pagan, dying and rising God type of things. But it was certainly in the air, and it certainly was interpreted much more that way in the Gentile churches than it was in the, um, in the early Messianic churches. So the Havura of Mar Yeshua, the Havura meal, was a mystic participation in the Messianic banquet. It was a celebration of the coming of the Messianic Age. It comes secretly, and uh, no one can say lo here or lo there, but it is here and it is among us, and the kingdom of God is inside of, within, entos, you. The early Gentile Christians were used to another kind of meal that was done, that was a memorial meal, to uh, memorialize uh, as a memorial service to a person who had died. And that was called an agape meal. So that at the time of the death day, sometimes at the time of the birthday of the person who had died, their friends would come together to remember them and to celebrate and to eat and drink and get a little bit too drunk and things like that and have a rather uh, body meal celebrating the person who had died in honor of that person. That was called an agape meal. <coughs> so uh, there were also bread and wine sacraments, we know, that were used for dying and rising gods, as in Mithraism, for example, the, that there were bread and wine meals where one ate the body and uh, flesh of Mithra or of Dionysus or whatever. These ideas uh, of connecting food and the eating of food with the taking into you or yourself of the actual presence of the God, the physical presence of the God, into you through a sacrament was uh, known quite a ways back. It was not uh, what Jesus was doing with the, the Havura meal, but in early Gentile Christians, all these traditions came together. You might recall that St. Paul, in speaking to people having their love feasts or the early agape meals where they all came together, he said, no, 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 don't do it this way. Don't come here to eat and drink and satisfy your hunger. Come here with reverence, and you come here to uh, 
eat a mystic food and drink a mystic uh, drink and that uh, uh, people who do not perceive the body and blood of the Christ uh, eat and drink damnation unto themselves. And so it was Paul who actually kind of straightened this out and really created what we think of as the Christian communion. And that is uh, quite a bit removed from the Messianic banquet, which was a joyous thing of the Master. So the Lord's uh, Supper of St. Paul is no longer a real meal anymore. It's a sacramental meal, a purely sacramental meal. Uh, and uh, that's the way it carried on in Christianity. Now, it is interesting that we can say that the the meal of Yeshua was to feed the body and nourish the body. Uh, the, the, the Messianic banquet, the Havura meal, was for the purpose of eating. It wasn't just a sacramental meal. But there were sacramental parts to it where uh, wine was blessed and then everyone sipped out of it. And bread was blessed and broken and passed around and there was a sacramental aspect to it so it was it was somewhat like what Paul wanted to have done and what probably Paul was taught by the earlier true apostles and disciples of the master Jesus but uh, and uh, it, it was uh, it was different it became gentilified and sacramentalized in a very different kind of way than anything had ever been done in Judaism before. But as you can see, there are parallels to the sacred meals, the Shabbat Seder, and uh, this kind of a meal that, uh, that Yeshua would. <coughs> Today and in the medieval period, the Christian Eucharist or Mass uh, is handled in such a way that... Uh, the holiness of the elements is uh, emphasized far, far, far to the point of excluding the teachings of the Master Jesus. The food and drink was done in conjunction with the teachings, the messianic teachings that Jesus would give on discipleship and uh, the things that were associated with that and the mysteries and the inner things. But this is not done. We have sermons about uh, about scripture and different things like this, but in the modern Christian Eucharist or Mass, uh, it's basically a mystic communion, and frankly, it goes an awful lot better if you don't have sermons and a lot of interruptions. It just goes a lot better if it's done uh, with letting the sacrament itself speak for itself in its own symbolic way, in my opinion. But uh, the Christian Eucharist or Mass is then the, the far development from that uh, messianic banquet, the, the celebration of the marriage of human and divine. Now the next thing we want to look at is halakha. Halakha is a word meaning a, uh, a discipline. It's a way of walking, literally. When Jesus says, follow me, he's saying, uh, take upon yourself my halakha. And it's my, the teaching of how you live. It's the discipline for a Jewish Talmud, a Jewish disciple. A Jewish disciple, uh, a Talmud of a, a rav or a rabbi, although in those days we didn't have rabbinic Judaism, the way it developed in the next few centuries. But that discipline was called the halakha. And it meant different things for different masters. Uh, for example, in the case of John the Baptist, it, it involved diet. Uh, it involved kinds of clothing that were wore. I mean, if worn if you, you were a disciple of John the Baptist, you didn't eat certain foods and you wore a hair shirt and all this sort of thing. Uh, it involved certain kind of rituals that you took upon yourself and a certain way of interpreting Torah. At Qumran, for example, there was a very uh, very detailed rule of the order, and that was the halakha of the order. That was the rules of the order. It's found in the Essene Manual of Discipline, which you can read. It's very, very precise, and there's very much involved there. But Yeshua's halakha was a way of walking in life, not in a separated community, not out in the desert living in caves. <coughs> 
it was a, a an, and the word halakha really translates as way of walking, your way of being, your way of uh, interacting in life. And that's where he taught it and how he taught it. People didn't come out in the desert to hear what he had to say. He was on the streets with people. <coughs> and it was an invitation to become aware of and become part of the new the renewal the renewal of covenant between God and man that is the messianic invitation and when Yeshua says uh, come follow me the way we see it translated it's come adopt my halakha adopt my way of being that's the messianic invitation how kani is uh, in Aramaic means literally follow me follow my halakha. And this is what Yeshua did to invite people to become part of this. <coughs> now, those who were the hearers and chose to do this were baptized. Uh, they were baptized by the disciples of Jesus, and it was considered to be the same thing as the baptism of John. The reason baptism was so important in the earliest Christianity is because it was there from the very beginning. It was the mikvah the sacred ritual of bathing that one used to separate one old time and one old person from a new time and a new person. The followers very often left their lives behind, even if only temporarily, and they walked. They literally walked physically with Yeshua and his disciples. Jesus was itinerant. He walked from place to place, and then he ate where he was invited, and so on. He was a peripatetic teacher, like uh, some many of the great uh, Greek philosophers, and so when he said Halcani, follow me, people dropped their fishing nets and said, "Okay, I'll do it." This sort of thing is a little, perhaps a little bit extreme uh, uh, in terms of what the reality was, but basically they literally left their lives behind for a while to follow this man and hear his teaching. And many of these then became accepted disciples. They uh, they stayed with Jesus. They weren't necessarily with him going everywhere, walking everywhere with him in all places, but they maintained a safe house for him. They maintained a, a place for him and his disciples to be when he came to their town. Uh, they per, they were kind of the advance guard. They prepared other people for the fact that Yeshua and the disciples were coming to town. And these became the disciples of Yeshua. And Many times uh, they got the word out and large crowds of people would be gathered and he would preach from from the hills down to a large people on a plain. <coughs> and the closest of these disciples became the inner group that would sit with Yeshua at the Messianic Havura banquet. Now it was a great, great honor to sit with a spiritual teacher of Judaism at that time in a meal because that was the inner place where people were accepted and allowed to be. So the stories of a uh, an anonymous prostitute coming up and being allowed in and, and washing his feet with her hair and her tears is 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 a something that a person at that time would consider to be way out of line with anything that a real uh, great rabbinic teacher would ever experience or would allow or would do. The, the, the Havura meal, the Havura banquet that Yeshua presided over, which was a teaching event and a, and a communion event, was something that only those who knew very well what they were doing were invited to, and these were the ones that he initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, which we'll be talking about later. The initiation of disciples into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven uh, was done at night time, and we have some descriptions, one from the secret gospel of Mark, one is the story of the transfiguration, of close, close disciples being initiated into these things. And Yeshua tells many parables of the kingdom and uh, this sort of thing. But uh, what does this mean, the kingdom of heaven? Well, the kingdom is the Malkuth of the heavens. And the kingdom of heaven, Malkuth, does not mean a kingdom, as we think. When we say, think of a kingdom, we think of a geographical turf that's ruled by a ruler. Uh, like a king domain. But Malkuth doesn't mean that. It means a rulership. It means a sovereignty. And the kingdom of heaven, 
is the imminent and real presence of a sovereign God in our very lives invisible to us. As Yeshua said, the kingdom of heaven is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. And we can learn uh, about what he might have done with his closest disciples by things we can find outside of the Gospels as well, from the secret Gospel of Mark and from the Gospel of Mary, which talk about the being initiated or a people being initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Now another aspect of the religion and practices of Yeshua was his opposition to asceticism, to ascetic practices, which John the Baptist used and promoted. Um, Yeshua was a thoroughgoing prophet. He was thoroughgoingly prophetic in his understanding of everything, his understanding of morality and righteousness and all this sort of thing uh, was not uh, based upon what one did at the temple. In fact, he saw the temple as a corrupt institution. Uh, on the other hand, it was not necessarily at all related to the asceticism of the prophets. Uh, Yeshua rejected the uh, value of symbolic ritual and animal sacrifices as a means of attunement or justification with God. Justification with God or attunement to God came in very different ways. It came through nacham, submission. It came through humility. It came through recognition of one's own uh, errors and attempts to correct them. It was an inner thing. It had nothing to do with killing an animal or uh, selling, paying so much money for a priest to kill an animal and say a prayer. So he totally rejected this sort of thing. He was very much involved in the inner and deep prophetic understanding. The whole key to it was intention. Uh, it was what the prophets called the sacrifice of the pure heart. That's a true sacrifice, not the sacrifice of a bullock or, a, uh, uh, or any other kind of an animal. It's the sacrifice of a pure heart. And a sacrifice means uh, not something that you uh, destroy or kill, but something that you make sacred. To make something uh, a sacrament is to make it sacred. And so the sacrifice of a pure heart is the offering to God uh, in all honesty and sincerity a pure heart. Now Yeshua was accused of being a libertine and that was a very, very bad thing for a Jewish teacher to be because one of the ways that people decided somebody was a holy man was because he wore a hair shirt and uh, only ate two or three things and stayed away from women and didn't associate or get anywhere near sinners. But Jesus did all of these things. And he was accused, therefore, of being the opposite of an ascetic. He was accused of being a libertine. Uh, for example, we'll talk about the question, why do your disciples not fast like the disciples of John the Baptist? He's asked uh, by people who don't really want to know the answer. They just want to really trap him. Um, and he associated with and he ate with what were called publicans and sinners, the publicans, tax collectors, people who were considered to be non-religious, people who were going to go to hell when they died. He associated with these people. And he drank wine. Uh, he didn't forego drinking of wine. The only time that Jesus, we have any saying of Jesus where he says, I'm not going to drink wine, is he says, as he's being uh taken out to be crucified, he says, well, I will not drink wine with you again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of heaven. And that is a reference to resurrection. So drinking of wine is is a, is allegorically a, a, represent, a representation of joy. Yeshua was all about joy. He was about the teaching of joy and the transmission of joy, not uh, slapstick joy but a deep and high and beautiful inner kind of joy. Uh, and he did drink wine because in those days uh, wine uh, uh, helped a person to feel good uh, after a long day of work or walking or something like that was a way of relaxing. Uh, 
and it represented joy. Wine represented a way of, of finding joy. Not drunkenness, and not gluttony, but wine, a small amount. And the wine was mixed with water. Uh, it was not a strong port like Catholic priests put in the Eucharistic service. Uh, it was not uh, uh, a, something that was highly alcoholic. It was just a wine, 6 or 7% alcohol, and mixed with water. And the wine actually was antimicrobial and probably uh, helped to purify the water or to uh, make it safer. There's a great irony about all this. Uh, not long at all after the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Yeshua, uh, very early forms of asceticism became very fashionable among uh, both Jewish and Gentile Christians. In fact, asceticism was the way the culture uh, defined sainthood. And so the early Jewish Ebionites and the Gnostic Christians were ascetic, they were anti-marriage, they were opposed to marrying. Even St. Paul talked about it's uh, better to marry than to burn, but it's sort of a second choice. So in later centuries, Christian priests became ascetic and unmarried, and asceticism became the hallmark of Christianity by the second century. <coughs> 